Good evening. Good evening and thank you for joining us uh, for our 2020 skills workshop webinar series for high school students and parents and caregivers. My name is Dr. Joan Reed. I'm president and chair of the Biomedical Science Careers Program and Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. Tonight is the first webinar in a weekly eight part series. And this session will focus on how to choose where to apply to college and ultimately find a good fit, as well as technical aspects and tips on the application process. The Skills Workshop webinar series was created to address the needs of underrepresented minority and disadvantaged high school students by providing concrete information on the skills needed for success in their academic career. Webinar subject areas will cover topics addressed during our, what is our traditional in-person program and also include information students and parents have indicated that they need now. Future session topics include getting into college part two, essay and personal statement, a session for parents and caregivers, one on community college pathways, one on finances and your education, a topic on interviewing skills, one on tips for resume and cover letter, and we'll culminate the series focusing on internships and summer opportunities. The program is co-sponsored by the Harvard Medical School Office for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnership and the Biomedical Science Careers Program BSCP. And now I just want to turn to a few of our housekeeping items for this series tonight. All lines will be muted and the chat function has been disabled. And I ask that you communicate by the Q&A tab that you'll see in your webinar panel towards the bottom. Webinar recordings will be available on the BSCP and on the DICP websites. And each participant will receive a supplemental packet of information email to the address in which you registered for this session by the end of the day on Friday. And at the end of this, there will be a set of poll questions, very short, and we ask you to stay on to answer those poll questions. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening. It's Dr. Raphael Luna. Dr. Luna is Associate Dean of the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences and Director of the Boston College Pre-Health Program and director of the Gateway Scholars Program in STEM at Boston College. Dr. Luna is a member of the BSCP Board of Directors, a BSCP Student Advisor, and a member of the Planning Committee for the New England Science Symposium. But importantly, he was also a former BSCP student and trainee. And with that, Dr. Luna. Thank you very much, Professor Reed. Uh, really excited to be here today. Um, and we have a, a really exciting um, format for today. Uh, and I'll just speak a little bit about that. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'll introduce the panelists. Then, we'll be, then we will begin by answering a few questions that were submitted ahead of time. So thank you for all those students that were on top of it and then submitted those questions early. We really liked that. So that really helped us kind of frame some of the questions and topics today. So that was very helpful. We got great questions. Um, and then we'll be followed by live uh, questions from the Q&A tab. So please, if you have questions all along or you thought maybe I didn't submit something I, as I wanted to, but this is what I'm thinking, start submitting it. Whenever you, it comes to you, uh, you know, you don't want to wait too long because you, you don't want to forget that question, right? And so, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible. But please, we're trying to get through as many questions as possible. So please try to submit short, clear questions and we would do our best to answer them. I hope that's okay with everyone, but do you, you do you, you submit your questions and we'll do our best to answer them. And we have a very exciting and uh, really talented panel for you today. Um, and first I would like to start off by introducing Mr. Stephen Abbott, uh, who's a, an Associate Director of Admissions and Coordinator of Native Indigenous Outreach at Dartmouth. He is also a, a living learning community fellow as well. And then we have our next pa uh, panelist is Mr. Kirsch uh, Adonis. And he's this uh, Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions at Worcester State University. And last but not least, we have Ms. Tammy Fee Manid, um, who is, uh, uh, she, she works with a, a nonprofit and education strategies consultant 
and she is also a former assistant director of admissions at Dartmouth and MIT. So, um, so let's go ahead and get started. And so what we'll do is uh, the first question is going to be for everyone. Um, and we'll start off with Mr. Abbott, you know, with a question that came in, why go to college? Why go to college? And given this current climate, is it still important to go to college? Yeah, well, thanks very much. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody. Thanks for having me tonight. And I think it's a, you know, really important question, a pivotal question. And obviously, one of the first things that people associate a college degree with is career opportunities and um, opportunities for income and things like that. And that's certainly true. Um, I think the uh, most recent calculations put the average person with a BA uh, about a million dollars ahead by the end of their career as opposed to somebody with a high school diploma or a GED. So there's certainly a lot of opportunities that can come up in terms of um, career preparation and lifetime earnings and things like that. But obviously that depends a great deal on individual circumstances and all kinds of things. So I think there's a lot more behind a college degree and a college experience um, than just the career preparation. And so obviously everything from personal enrichment and intellectual expansion to networking, the opportunity to meet people from all over the country, from all over the world, uh, and both on a social level as well as on a pre-professional level. I think that's really invaluable um, experience. And I think for a lot of um, our students too, I mean, there's such an amazing opportunity to elevate your family and your community. Um, you know, all of us serve as role models, whether we, you know, want to or do so willingly or not, but we have family members and community members that are looking up to us and setting those good examples for them, I think is really important. Um, and just the opportunities to engage critically and be an informed citizen, be an informed person, family member, all those kinds of things can really be enhanced by a college experience. So um, I do think it is still, you know, very relevant and very important for those who choose that route. So. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Abbott. That was really helpful. You know, some of the key takeaways, you know, like that, you know, that it's important and meaningful and also like, you know, an increase of a million dollars in lifetime earnings. I, I'm sure that got a lot of students' attention and their families as well. So thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Donis, uh, would you mind um, commenting on this as well? Yeah, uh, Stephen said it very well and articulate. Um, you know, what, what I can share, you know, with folks, um, you know, who are watching this, this webinar today is that, you know, it, it really helps out, you know, your income, um, you know, uh, ability. Um, you know, I think many of you in the room could be first generation of college, um, you know, recent immigrants in, individuals are in, this gives you an opportunity to really change um, your, your trajectory of your earnings in the future. Um, just like how Stephen had mentioned, um, you know, when you go to college, you build your network. Your network of folks is that you have mentors that, that you meet with, professors are really um, are connecting with you. So you have individuals who are really, you know, looking out for your best interests. And you also find yourself, I think, um, you know, for a personal experience um, that probably everybody can share is that, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, when one goes through high school, you're, you're taking classes, of, you know, why, why am I taking these courses? You know, having that college experience really can find yourself as a better person, know more about your background, um, but it's just so relevant that you can you can go on and, and go on to get your master's or PhDs, you know, like just like Dr. Luna, um, who's our moderator tonight, you can see his, his title, I really have pride, you know, right now I've only got my master's degree, um, but that's something that's goals that we should be really working towards um, and, and bringing up your family and leaving your legacy um, once you do complete that college degree. Thank you, Mr. Donis. That's uh, great. And thanks for the shout out. Um, but, you know, you know, just changing the, the trajectory, college can change the trajectory of your story. That's really impactful. Thank you for sharing that as well. Um, uh, Ms. Manid, uh, would you mind also commenting why go to college? And is it important still to go to college during this current climate? Thank you. Um, so absolutely believe that each and every student should make the decision for themselves of what is their post-secondary pathway. What does success look like for them? Um, and when you think about your end goal, think about wh what are the tools that you need to build to get there um, in order to be the most successful blank that you want to be, right? And college, for the most part, is a key uh, component to having a very successful trajectory. And so it is still important to consider college as one of those options. Is it the only way to be successful? No, but again, having that um, understanding of yourself, what are 
the skills that you already have? What are the skills that you need to continue to build? And what is it that you truly want to be? And what is your imprint on this world? And is college going to be a part of that? Um, so it really, again, is about the student. Um, it should be a student-owned process. And when you own that process, that is part of being successful in what your life's trajectory will be part of. Wow, thank you so much, Ms. Manita. You're quite inspired, you know, but you know, your, your message about self-awareness and the skills that you have, the skills that you need and who you want to become. And that's really impactful. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that resonated with a lot of the students. So let's get to that next question. Our uh, next question is, how can I best prepare myself for college while in high school? What are things that I can do um, now, today? And we have different students from all different levels, ages in high school, but mainly 11th and 12th graders. But even if you can also comment a little bit on some of the 9th and 10th graders that we do have as well. So, um, and this time, let's go in reverse order. So how about Ms. Manid? Uh, can you come on that, comment on that, please? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I want everyone to really think about each and every part of their high school career as the different legs on a chair, if you will. So you have the standardized test leg, you have your academics and the courses that you're taking, you have your extracurricular activities, and then there's another leg that I like to call your personal passion projects. Each of those legs make up the full chair. Can a chair still work with only three out of the four legs? Absolutely. And so it's really important to utilize your high school career to help build the muscle or strengthen that leg of that chair that needs the best or most attention, right? And when you're being reviewed in the college admissions process, it really is looking at you and your contacts. So don't worry about what private school is doing over here or another public school or a magnet school or a charter school. Worry about what your school is offering you and take advantage of all of those pieces and really find your own footing in how you are creating and demonstrating impact, not only in your community, um, but at home um, and maybe the other communities that you are a part of. But I think the biggest uh, thing for me is for uh, students to think about their high school uh, trajectory and their career as, did I maximize my high school experience given everything that was available to me? Wow, great answer. Building the four leg muscles, uh, the, the four legs of a chair, that's fantastic. And maximizing everything you can do now, that's great. Um, so, uh, Mr. Donis, uh, could you also comment on that too, please? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so in high school, you know, what, what, um, what my, what my co-panelist co said, Tammy Fate, you know, it's about, you know, really maximizing your opportunity in, in, in high school. Uh, you really want to see, take full advantage. Um, you know, there's some, there's a term that we use a lot in admissions world is holistic process. So we get to view you academically. We want to definitely see that GPA, but how will you be an asset to our community on our campuses? And also, you know, you know, what activities have, have you been, have been doing? So I know that just for academic pieces, I always want to let students know, you know, taking those advanced placement courses is, is very helpful. Taking honors levels or, or better, do enrollment, this college classes that give you a preview of what college would, would be like. You know, that's what that's information that admissions professionals definitely like to see and also get involved in your community, um, you know, doing those activities, um, you know, just like the program that, that we're part of tonight. Um, it really speaks a lot of volumes of how you have invested in your education, how you present yourself, because um, many students, we review a lot of applicants every year. And also, you know, and then we want to make sure how, how do you stand up, tell your story. I like how Timmy Faye, Faye said, I, I really like to own that process. You really want to seek out all the resources that, that you have and see how you can shine and, and, and present yourself as, as a high school leader, um, you know, on, on the different organizations or programs that you've been involved with. Because um, that, that's really what we, we definitely enjoy seeing um, because we want to see that student who can complement, be, be successful in the classroom, but what are you doing outside of the classroom, um, you know, to complement your, your college experience or be an asset to our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Abbott, uh, could you also comment on this? This is a great discussion. 
I can sure try. I would start with a, a double ditto to, to everything that's been said so far. I think some great, uh, great points have already been raised um, by both Tammy Fee and Kirsch. Um, I, I think I would, you know, just picking up on a, a term that Kirsch used there. I mean, um, this is one of the ways that I always refer to the college application process is this is storytelling um, and this is you sharing your story. Um, this is your opportunity to you know, share with us as admissions officers or as people at these colleges and universities what your journey to date has really been and where you see that going. And so it's really never too early to start thinking about what that story is. And so I think it's very important, obviously, to take advantage, like Kirsch said, of, you know, more challenging courses and be willing to push yourself um, and all those, you know, extracurricular activities. It's also really important to remember there isn't one right way to get into college. Um, when you look at all of these different schools, first of all, all different schools, there's almost 4,000 different colleges and universities around the country. Um, and they're all different and they're all building different communities and they're all looking at different people. And so the idea that, you know, there's one particular route that I have to follow or one set of things that I have to do, or there's code words I have to work into my essay someplace, um, all of that's just not true. It really is about the reflection of yourself and everything that um, is important to you. And so one of the things I would really encourage all the students out there is follow, you, follow your passions. Um, you know, we really want to know what gets you excited. Um, and I really encourage people not to worry about what is it the colleges are looking for, but think about instead what you have to say, what do you have to contribute, what's important to you, um, what drives you. And, you know, um, just as a logistical point too, I think it really helps particularly for um, some of the younger students out there, start keeping track of these things too, because when you sit down to type out that college application, thinking back just over the last four years of like, man, what's everything that I've done in the last four years that I wanna share with a college, that can be really hard. So keep track of those awards, keep track of, you know, different activities that you've been involved with. And remember, this isn't just about stuff you do at school. It's really important to include things like that you do with your community community, things that you might do with your family. A lot of you guys have really serious, you know, significant family responsibilities. Colleges want to know about all different aspects of you. And I think sometimes a lot of students sell themselves short because they're really only focused on those organized activities or the school, um, you know, things that you do at school and your life is so much bigger than that. So um, again, just think about it in the sense of, of, you know, sharing your story with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and we got a, uh, in, in the, um, question to answer but you know the two panelists mentioned about taking rigorous courses right and so this question would be for mr donis about ap courses so you know we have a talented audience now with students striving but some schools don't offer a, uh, ap courses or that many ap courses so i guess this is like a multi-layered question mr donis but you know when it comes to a ap is it more important for college to see the grade you were able to obtain or the ap exam uh, that you, uh, the score from the AP exam. And also, um, when it comes to AP courses, is it more important for, um, yeah, and so also, like, if you didn't take it in your sophomore year, will that impact? Or what about your senior year when the scores don't come out? Could you just touch a little bit about this and explain that? Yeah, I should summarize. So advanced placement coursework is great. It's a preview of what college course will look like. But I always put it in perspective. An AP course is still a whole calendar year. Remember, what you learn in college is done in 15 weeks, typically. So I know that the course content um, is definitely similar, but just to kind of give you a breakdown of, of what the difference of how you would learn that, that advanced placement coursework. But for a mission council, we like to see the grade. I feel that that's more relevant of you were able to, to read the assignment, were able to do the test within, within that course throughout that, that calendar year. I feel that, you know, the AP exam is a bonus. Uh, you know, some schools, it's a scale of one to five. So most colleges will minimum accept a three or higher for college credit. More competitive universities may accept for, for, as a four. When we review your transcript uh, for admission at the time, remember, typically AP exams of a senior year, we don't see those results. So we're really seeing the grades that you've completed. Typically on a transcript, it's not, it's not showing that what, what you result of the AP exam. So it's really an additional layer or a bonus. Um, so I would say that, you know, having the, the AP exam result, um, you know, doing the best on, on that exam. However, um, you know, the, having the, doing gr the grade in the course is, is really a preview of what you complete in college. And I would say you wouldn't be typically, well, typically you wouldn't be at a disadvantage. You wanna make sure you have a, a balanced course load of high school classes. I've seen some students taking four, five AP classes in a year, 
they we did well in three of them and they didn't do too too well in the other ones. So it's kind of a balance. You really want to um, have no have a great discussions with with, um, with your counselors to know what how you can have a, a good course selection, but also have a successful course selection. So you want to kind of really see how how that how that opportunity would be available to you. And I always want to share that if you're able to take a class in your local community college or college. Um, for your school, you are able to complete that course is due enrollment and that class is for you to, to keep and you can pretty much take it to any college that you apply to. Thank you, Mr. Donuts. This is fantastic. Great, great advice. Um, and so, you know, and, and our next question, uh, we're going back to some of the uh, submitted questions. Uh, and this one is for uh, Ms. Manid. You know, we have a question that comes in and says, am I qualified? And who decides that? Uh, and what can I do to improve my chances for admission to a college of my choice? Um, can you talk about that? Like, because that's kind of a big question. Um, but if you could kind of unpack that for us in the audience, we would greatly appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. Um, and before I address this question, just to add on to the AP exam question, I would say that um, if your school doesn't offer AP exams, um, you know, you're going to be judged in the context of your environment, right? So that's one important thing. One way to show colleges that you are taking initiative um, and owning your academic pathway is to look on um, online platforms and either take audit a course and take it for just enrichment, not a grade. Um, for example, to highlight the Johns Hopkins University Center for Talented Youth Program. They offer a slew of um, online coursework that you can do and, some, and be prepared to sit for the AP exam if you so choose. I think um, to double down on what my colleagues have said is it's demonstrating your passion within those um, of taking control of your academics is what is really important when it comes to the advanced placement courses. Um, so am I qualified and who decides that? Um, and what can I do to improve my chances of admissions for the colleges of my choice? Um, am I qualified? Yes, you are amazing, you matter. You are um, surviving in this world that <laughs> when I, my high school career didn't look like this. So you guys are living through something that is historical. Um, so I would say um, you are qualified. Absolutely, hands down. Um, who decides? For me, again, on to not to keep saying this, but you decide. You make the choices that impact your trajectory. And it's important for you to realize that, you know, there's not someone else sitting in a boardroom, um, you know, twiddling their fingers and saying, like, who can I count out now? It's not like that. You have the opportunity to present yourself in, on paper in the best way possible and making sure that you, you utilize as many of your um, mentors, um, trusted adults, uh, teachers um, along the way to help you do that. And while an institution does decide whether you are accepted, denied, or waitlisted, they're not canceling you. They're canceling your candidacy. And I want to be very clear on that, that if you are, if you do not get into the school of your choice, they didn't cancel you. They said no to your candidacy. Those are very different things that I want our scholars to really think about. Um, and there's a lot of anxiety around that, and I just want to name that. Um, and in terms of how do you improve your chances for the, the, uh, the college of your choice is really knowing that college, doing the double click, not just looking on their main page and seeing the smiling students walking through their campus. What do you wanna study there? Did you go to the faculty member page that is doing the work that you want to do one day? Are you attending free live webinars that that faculty member is hosting? Are you attending the virtual information sessions um, or any of the virtual programming that that college is, is offering you? Um, are you reaching out and asking to speak to real life students 
about their experience on those campuses. That is how you can improve your chances for admissions because it's all about fit and match. How are you the best candidate for this institution? You demonstrate that through showing that you know the school and that you know that you're gonna be a good fit and match for that community. Thank you, amen to that. Like, and, and students do decide. And so that, thank you for sharing that. That was very impactful. I really appreciate that. I'm sure the families and the students appreciated that too. Our next question is about the, the SAT, right? And so uh, you have a question here, it says, uh, both in the chat, the live chat. So thank you for to all the students that are submitting these questions. They're great. We are looking at them and we're embedding them with our other questions as well. So we are going to try to get to you on the these. So it's a so the question is, what do I do if my placement testing has been canceled? Do I need an SAT or ACT score this year? What if I took it previously and I don't like my score? Should I still submit them? Um, and then uh, and then also if you can, and this is for Mr. Abbott, and if you can also just dovetail you know, how large of a role does the SAT and ACT scores play within admissions um, for this cycle and perhaps beyond? So as best as you can. Sure, yeah. No, I think it's a great question. I think testing is something that's always, you know, forefront on people's minds as, as we think about the college process. So um, probably easiest to answer for this year, which is um, that I think uh, as far as I know, every school in the country has now gone to test optional uh, because of the COVID situation. There just has not been reliable opportunities for students to get out and engage the SATs, the ACTs, the SAT2s, the whole alphabet soup of um, standardized testing that's out there. So, um, so that in, and you know, test optional means exactly that. It is entirely your choice to decide whether or not you want to submit scores if you have them. And if you don't have them, it means it does not count against you. So I know, for example, our dean has been really at the forefront of saying, when we say test optional, this is not test optional wink, like we're still expecting it. Um, this is test optional. It is entirely your choice at this point. So if you've taken an SAT or an ACT and you're comfortable with your score and you think it reflects you know, the type of work that you're capable of doing, Go ahead and submit it if that's if that's what you would like to do if you have taken the test you're not satisfied with your score or you just really don't want that to be a part of your profile don't submit it um, and if you haven't had the opportunity to take the test or if your test dates get canceled or anything like that um, absolutely nothing to worry about because uh, all the schools in the country are in this are in this situation so it's not going to work uh, not going to work against you as far as what things will look like next year, I think most schools are kind of in a, in a holding pattern right now, just not knowing you know, what we're gonna be facing uh, in terms of the opportunities for these exams. So some schools haven't really made an announcement uh, for future years, what the test, you know, uh, test optional status will be. Some schools have been test optional already going into this year. So that's one of the many factors to consider you know, as you are building your list of schools that you think you might be interested in applying to. So uh, some schools will tell you under a, you know, a normal year uh, that you need to reach a certain test score in order to be admitted. It's what we call um, threshold-based admissions or bright line admissions. You have to have a certain GPA, you have to have a certain test score. Other schools, in fact, quite a few schools, um, Kirsch used this, this phrase earlier, use what we call a holistic process, which means it's one of many, many factors that we're looking at in terms of your application. So um, a lot of schools out there really do use this holistic process. So it's not just a question of looking at your GPA and looking at your test scores and deciding whether or not you get in. Those are just two things that can be, you know, can be considered. Um, testing overall, it's going to vary a lot between different types of institutions and different specific institutions as to how much they value it. Um, but it's also going to depend, particularly with those schools that do use a holistic review process. Um, we've already mentioned several times that you're always looked at in context. Um, so it's not going to be a question of, you know, I have to reach this, you know, this particular score or um, things like that because <clears throat> you're going to be looked at in terms of other people in your area, other people in your school, what have you had access to, uh, what have you done with what you've had access to, all of those different kinds of things. So some schools do rely fairly heavily in normal years on test scores. Some schools pay very little attention to it. Um, it really does you know, come down to the individual institution. Overall, um, your test score doesn't really tell very much about you at the end of the day. <clears throat> 
most of these standardized tests, um, you know, are uh, <clears throat> they they have their limitations, and you know, data shows us that they have some predictive value in terms of how well you might do in the first year. Fairly limited, but they certainly don't tell us how smart you are. They certainly don't tell us how hard you work. Um, they certainly don't tell us anything else about you. It's it's how well you perform on the test. So if for the younger students, um, if we do go back to you know employing these tests, the more you practice, the more you're aware of what to you know expect on the tests. Usually, the more you can raise you raise your scores. Um, these are there's nothing magical about them. It really just does take you know uh, take a lot of practice to to do well on them. Um, so you know definitely encourage people to try to prepare as best as possible. But remember, it's only only one factor of a great many that are going to go into your application. And just to stress it again for this year, um, it's something that test optional is test optional. So it's nothing to worry about for this year. Uh, thank you so much. That was a great answer. Um, and uh, the next question is going to be for Mr. Donis. Um, and uh, Ms. Manid mentioned, you know, the legs of the application. One of those were, were like the academics and grades. And so we have this duality of stories here. Like, uh, we've got, um, I'm, so I'm pull these from the question and answer, uh, the Q and A, so thank you for keeping the, these going. And one student said, I miss barely, I, I barely missed the honor roll with around a 2.9 GPA the past three years. Uh, I'm, she's, uh, the student's a senior, and is it too late to make that look good? And then the other one is on the other end, um, where it says uh, that the, during the freshman year, that student didn't do so well in their classes, but by sophomore year, they started pulling it up. And at the end, they ended up with a, a GPA of about a 3.7. How will the freshman years look? So can you talk about like, you know, the, 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 those range like a 2.9 after four years and like starting off with a, uh, a lower GPA and going up to a 3.7? And how important are grades during this uh, time for admissions as well? Yeah, so thank you for that. It's great questions. So I'll start off with with having that freshman year. You know, every student typically has a, a challenge when they do transition. Um, you know, every school's a little bit different. Middle school going to high school. Uh, so what we like to see if anybody follows the economics, the stock market, we like to see a trend, a curve that goes up. So if a student is going up, um, you know, starting from freshman year, a lot of things may happen. Things happen in life. Family situations do occur. Um, but we like to see a student's, you know, GPA junior senior is probably a better better indicator of a student's ability to be successful i really want to share with steven to to um to basically back him up with what he says the data does show that a student's uh, high school gpa is a better indicator of a student's ability to be successful in, in college um so with that said you know we we see that if a student's trend is 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 on the rise junior senior year is is where where you know where they're at academically and, and it's really it, it is speak volumes when you do uh, present your candidacy um, to the admissions committee um, at, at our institutions. I also want to share if a student, you know, falls short of a 2.99, you know, we, we want to see with the class rigor, you know, how did you get those classes? You know, I see a question coming in there where, you know, is it better to get a B um, um, in, in an honors class or just get an A regular? Uh, we always said we want to push yourself. I mean, that's been consistently said on the panel. We want to, you know, you want to take, you know, rigorous coursework because that is the coursework that is going to best prepare you how did you get, how did you improve that grade? How did you obtain it? Because in college, you're going to have opportunities where, you know, you, you may not get, you know, the grade that, that you want to achieve, but you are able to work, navigate and work with a professor to achieve the grade that, that, that you want to complete. So with a high school GPA, you know, we look at it very closely. It is, it is an important factor. Um, we did talk about essays, um, you know, an essay previously, but the GPA, um, I, I would say that we want to see how you're trending. And if a student is concerned, um, you know, um, about senior year, you still have first quarter grades, uh, something that we look closely, you know, we'll see how did you start from senior year? How serious are you? Um, you want to uh, abide by the deadlines. Each university that you apply to has different deadlines, but you still might have an opportunity for you to demonstrate what your courses are senior year and how you, you've done it, um, you know, um, for senior year uh, coming, coming, coming before applying. So that, that's very helpful. And now to just add, if there is an explanation that you want to provide for a certain course or situation, you can always contact the, you know, the admissions counselors. Um, you, there's always an, an addendum on the application or you know, just to find out if they do interviews, you can always you know, share more information of, of further explanation of your GPA if you feel that's not the best indicator of your ability. Thank, thank you so much. Um, this is really helpful. Um, and our next question is uh, for Ms. Manid. Um, 
it's a dual, dual question here. It's one like about financial aid and other one about, uh, so one was, how can financial aid for college be secured? Are there different types of aid based on school type, public, private, and religious? And then also, um, I want to pair this with another question that uh, students, uh, someone mentioned in the, in the chat. You know, uh, Ms. Manid, I like your idea of four legs. Can you please elaborate more on about personal passion project? So financial aid and the personal project, you know, that would be great if you could touch a base on that. Great, thank you. Um, so in terms of financial aid, um, this is where doing the double click on each university and college that you are applying to is very important. Um, to bring to light two terms that I um, always help my scholars look at is first, um, is the college need blind or is the college need aware? Need aware means we are considering whether or not you can afford and pay for this tuition that we are charging you. Need blind is we are not looking at your financial circumstance whatsoever in order to determine your admissions. Okay, so that's the first question um, I have uh, students ask. The second question is if they are need aware, you have to be very honest about your um, ability to afford that and being able to secure funding to demonstrate that you can afford that particular institution. If they are need blind, it means that they don't look at that and your, your income or your family's income as a, as a marker um, for admission. And what you need to ask then is how, how much of the demonstrated need does this school meet? Some schools meet 100% of the demonstrated need. Some meet 30%, some meet 50. This is not on the first page of everyone's website. You have to do the double click into their financial aid policies and procedures. You also must follow exactly what they require to fulfill those financial aid application. Usually it involves the FAFSA. Sometimes it will involve the CSS profile in addition to the FAFSA. And sometimes the schools have their own um, financial aid application internally that they ask you to fill out as well. So in terms of um, the financial aid and, and applying for financial aid at the different colleges you're applying to, it's very important to look at very specifically the policies and procedures of, the, of each institution. There's not a blanket answer for everyone. Um, the second question around um, elaborating on personal passion projects. Um, what I mean by that is how are you taking what it is you are excited about? What, how are you taking the learning that you're excited about outside of the classroom? This can happen in many different ways. We mentioned some earlier, taking a class at a at a college to get a little taste of that college life, um, taking a class online for enrichment. Um, another way to demonstrate your personal passion projects is to actually do an independent research project with a teacher mentor or a um, adult mentor. That is another way to demonstrate and, and do a deeper dive in your personal passion projects. So this could be, you know, I really love learning languages. Okay, great. What languages are we going to tackle this year? How are we going to demonstrate that we're really excited about linguistics? Um, another way to demonstrate this now that we're living in a more digital age is have you started, have you thought about starting a blog? Have you thought about um, starting uh, a program where you're volunteering at the local Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA um, or an after school program at a local elementary school. Um, these are all different ways that you are taking what you are excited about from school and taking it outside of the classroom and helping uh, the admissions officers see that you've been able to crystallize this uh, personal passion. Thank you so much. So informative. And, and thank you for really breaking down financial aid. And, um, and also, um, uh, Mr. Abbott, can you also comment on the financial aid, you know, uh, 
you know, what, what's the best, you know, what's the strategy? Can you add on to what Ms. Muneed uh, mentioned as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks. I, uh, so again, just backing up everything that, that Tammy Fee has said, and I uh, just wanted to pick up on two other really important terms that she alluded to in there as well. So, you know, understanding that difference between need blind and need aware is really, really critical as you step into the uh, step into the arena. And I mean, we could use the entire 90 minutes tonight just talking about financial aid and really only scratch the surface. It's a huge subject. Um, I know it's a very confusing subject and it's, it's a really daunting subject, I think, for most students and families. You know, looking at the cost of, uh, of colleges and universities, even relatively inexpensive schools nowadays are still very, very expensive. Um, so the good news is there is a lot of financial aid out there, even in our current economic recession and all that kind of thing. But two other terms to be really aware of that, that Tammy Fear alluded to um, are what we call um, need-based uh, need based financial aid as well as merit-based financial aid. Um, and I bring this up, I really want to reemphasize that just because I think oftentimes when we think about financial aid or we hear the word scholarship, we often affiliate that with academic achievement, athletic achievement, sort of a competitive process uh, that goes behind, you know, being the best at something. So, you know, you've made the honor roll or you're a, you know, top athlete, and you're being recruited by a college or university and those scholarships that come with that. But there are schools and there are scholarships out there that will provide funding for you just based on your family's need and your family's financial situation. Um, and those are really important options to think about too, particularly if financial aid is a, is a concern out there. So understanding you know, that there are these two different sources, some schools offer both merit-based and a need-based aid. Um, some schools only offer one or the other. So really important to walk into it. But I think one thing I always really like to share with people um, is that it can actually sometimes be cheaper for you to go to a more expensive school. And I will say that again, because it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, it can actually sometimes work out to be less expensive for some families and students to go to what looks like a more expensive school on paper, because often the schools that are charging more um, do have more financial aid to offer and more scholarships, more grants. Why don't those schools just charge less money to begin with? That's a great question and it's way above my pay grade, um, but it is an important thing to understand about the financial aid arena is I really encourage students and families don't walk away from a school just based on that sticker price, because until you get your financial aid package, whether it's need based, whether it's merit based, whether it's both, you're not going to know how much you're actually going to pay at that school until you get your financial aid. And there are some great tools available online. Every college and university is required to have what we call a net price calculator on their website right now. And that means that you can actually enter your family's financial information and get an idea of what your financial aid package would look like. So there is some opportunity to kind of predict as you're looking around, you know, what might be affordable for you and your family. But again, don't walk away from those schools because they look too expensive because sometimes those can actually be cheaper um, than, than schools that look a lot less expensive on paper. Thank you so much. Um, the uh, and then just while you were chatting, Mr. Abbott, uh, uh, someone came in. Where can we find scholarships? If you could comment a little bit, and maybe Mr. Donis as well, or Miss uh, Manit, just quickly, where can they find scholarships? Where do they find this money? You know, so. Yeah, I know it's a great question and there's a lot of different sources out there. Um, obviously a great place to start is just with the schools you're applying to, seeing what the aid is out there. Um, you know, most schools will offer you some sort of financial aid package. Um, in terms of looking for outside sources of scholarships, lots and lots of different places to go. Um, I generally recommend a couple of resources that are free. Um, there, first of all, it's really important never to pay money for scholarship searches. There are a lot of uh, resources out there that say, give us a hundred bucks and we'll give you, you know, 10 scholarships you can apply for. You're trying to get money. You don't want to pay money. Okay. So, um, don't, uh, don't be spending money on, on financial aid searches. One of the resources I think is really good is called fast web. It's F A S T W E B all one word.com. Uh, that's a free resource. You can just enter a profile and it will actually churn through the tens of thousands of scholarships that are out there and let you know based on your profile what you might qualify for. The College Board um, has an excellent um, resource on their, uh, their website as well that's very similar. Because um, if you just do a Google search for college scholarships, you'll lose your mind going through all kinds of stuff that's completely irrelevant. So those two are free. Um, they don't require any sort of you know, formal registration or anything like that. And they can be great resources. Um, and one little just personal tip that I always like to um, 
like to add in there is that uh, there's a great old Tanzanian proverb that says little by little, a little becomes a lot. Um, and so I always encourage people don't turn away from those smaller scholarships. Sometimes people want to focus on the really big money scholarships like Gates Millennium and Coke and Walmart offer these really big, uh, amazing scholarships. And you can absolutely apply for those. But um, the uh, but sometimes those little scholarships that are a couple hundred dollars, things like that, you think, wow, it's, you know, 20, 30, 50 thousand dollars I've got to come up with. Sometimes those scholarships are really, really easy to get. Um, I always share a, a friend of mine who applied for a scholarship through FastWeb a couple of years ago, and it was $150. And all he had to do was submit a paragraph based on why he wanted to go to college. And he said, two weeks later, I got a check in the mail for $150 and a handwritten note that said, thank you for applying for our scholarship. No one ever has before. Um, and that $150 paid for his books for the semester. So um, little by little, little becomes a lot. That's great. Yeah. And nobody wants to turn down that money. So that's great because college is qu could be quite expensive depending on where you go. Mr. Donuts, can you also uh, mention briefly, where do they find this uh, source of money to go to school? Yeah. So just like Steven said, I mean, you know, going on to those, to those portals, fast way with college board, I, that's my recommendation um, for it. But I also look in your community, you know, a lot of, a lot of these community scholarships, you know, whether you're local uh, credit union, you also have the, the booklet that they have probably in your, in your school, but you don't realize how many, how many scholarships are in your own backyard. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, and if you're coming from um, different multi-racial ethnic backgrounds, there's different ethnic uh, scholarships that you, that you would be able to qualify for. So I know that this is something that you definitely want to explore, um, you know, right in your own backyard. I feel that sometimes you may look at the national, but I, I feel there's many scholarship opportunities for you to assist um, for the opportunity. And I also just want to add, I know for scholarship, it's a family decision. Um, you know, don't let the price of a school discourage you from applying. Um, you want to uh, definitely go forward and, and go through the process, be accepted, get that full financial aid packet, because um, you want to kind of see how you can work and see if this is a financially fit opportunity for your, for your family. Um, I also, you know, talk about financial literacy, you know, how much debt will you will incur? Um, just to give a little bit in tip savvy, how much financial aid? Is that only your first year? Will it cover your second year, your third, your fourth year? You really want to um, see all those facts, see those numbers. Those numbers are well overwhelming. I'll, I'll, I'll be upfront with that. But as long as you have you know, the information, you can get assistance from your school or advisor. Um, I, that's my, my, my tip for you. Because remember, you if you've been accepted, even through early action, um, you know, I, I talk about deadlines. I know we didn't touch upon that. But if you're applying through the process, you have until May 1st to make a decision. So you have two or three months to evaluate your opportunity to which college and know that financially it would be a good fit for your family. Um, so that, that's what I would encourage that you have time. You want to, you know, stay, stay um, organized with this process, um, you know, for scholarships in the financial aid process. Thank you so much. Great. You know, thanks for those uh, tips of the trade. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure the students really appreciate that. Ms. Manita, uh, could you add any tricks of the trade or any, you know, how to be a little bit savvy? Uh, Donuts mentioned about like the community support. Could you uh, just add a little bit more? Where do they find this money? Because everyone talks about it, but where do they get it? <laughs> yeah, so I would start with your, um, you know, if there's a community a based organization that you've been attending for the bulk of your life, uh, like a YMCA or a Boys and Girls Club, they have scholarships that you can um, directly access as a member. Um, I would look at historical um, Black uh, fraternities and sororities, um, historically Latinx um, fraternities and sororities. They uh, have an academic um, sort of achievement component to each of their missions in terms of the education of our black and brown brothers and sisters. And so um, they also help um, in uh, students affording their college um, education as well. Um, you know, I would also look at your religious um, affiliations. Um, they also uh, will offer and sometimes meet that small, that gap. You might just be a little off in speaking to, you know, that deacon or that, um, uh, you know, rabbi might have an opportunity for you to access funds that you didn't even know were there. Um, also looking at the uh, local 
um, scholarships um, uh, in terms of Boston area. Um, a lot of our companies, um, uh, particularly in New England, have a, a, service, a community service component, not just going out into the community and volunteering time, but also volunteering resources, financial aid resources. Um, and so um, reaching out to companies like Fidelity, um, you know, uh, Ropes and Gray, some of the top firms, um, particularly if they are in the field that you want to be in, Right. Um, so if I want to be a lawyer, you know, looking at the different law law firms in this um, in the local uh, city or town that you're in is a great another way to get started in that direction. Thank you so much, Ms. Winnie. That was really helpful. All, all three of the panelists, you guys are just so inspiring. I just want to thank you while we're going through. Um, but we want to touch upon this. Um, there's a lot of things going on in our country, which, you know, um, with race and our problem with race in the United States. Um, uh, and that, you know, colleges are not immune to this. You know, so we have a question that was submitted before and one with a question and answer. Um, and this one is so important that we would like all three panelists to comment on this. We'll start off with uh, Mr. Abbott first, uh, but this, you know, student mentioned, how can I survive and succeed on predominantly white campuses? And then to give me more specificity, someone mentioned, as someone who's Haitian American, do you have any advice for me when working in programs and college classes where I'm going to be the only person of color? So, you know, can you just talk about that? And then we'll, we'll go for Mr. Abbott and then we'll touch base with Mr. Donis and then with Ms. Manid. Yeah, no, I think, uh, thanks. I think it's a really, really important question. And it's, it's always a tough one to answer because I think everyone's experiences are different. Um, I think, first of all, you know, the, one of the things that we always encourage our students to do is, is to seek out the resources that do exist on the campus. Um, and there is a lot of support available. Um, and it might come from other students. It may come from an administrative office. It may come from a faculty member. But find those mentors. Find those people who are going to support you. Find those people that you can just be real with, that you can vent with. Um, you know, most people, I think, and even research backs this up, uh, you know, most people can tie their success in college back to the intervention of one person. And that might be your best friend, it might be a roommate, it might be a faculty advisor, it might be someone who works in the dining hall, it might be someone who, you know, cleans the cleans the dorms, um, but somebody who believes in you and somebody that you can really turn to as a resource. Um, I think that's always really empowering. Um, second thing is always to remember your values, remember who you are, where you come from. Um, I think sometimes depending on the situation, it's really easy to start gaslighting yourself that, you know, wow, I, I, I must be off because everything around me seems like it's crazy. Um, and so it's always good to have, you know, again, the people, the community, uh, those backstops of, of people that you can check in with and make sure that you're staying true to who you are. Um, one of the things we do during our pre-orientation program is I actually encourage our students to write down someplace. Why are you going to college in the first place? What's motivating you to be here? What do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? Have that value statement somewhere close at hand. So when things do get tough, you can turn to that and be like, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's why I'm here. This is why I'm doing that. Um, and take the time, you know, to go home, to ground yourself um, and remember that your voice is really important. Your voice is, is um, what you bring to these colleges and uh, universities and um, be true to that and share that in the, in the classrooms. It's really important opportunities for um, you to get the most out of your education and for others to be able to learn from you as well. Thank you so much. Mr. Donis, could you add on to this, please? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Steph Stephen definitely summed it up uh, great. I, I would say that, you know, a student of color uh, on a predominantly white campus, you, you definitely want to work with, with affinity groups. So when I say that, there's, there's seven student organizations that will represent your ethnic background. Um, so that I feel that that's how you kind of build and learn more about your culture as well. Um, so you have, you know, right now we're, we're celebrating uh, Latinx Heritage Month. Um, so this is something that that most colleges are, are really, you know, talking about, you know, this is how you learn about other folks cultures. And I also want to share that you earn your spot to be there. Uh, so never feel that that, you know, you, you know, you, uh, that you feel out of place. You know, there, there's other folks that have walked through what you walk through prior for that college institution. You just got to find out you find out find those mentors um, that, that are available. Typically professors and most colleges may may um, provide you with a mentor or a coach um, and, and also want to say be, be, be real um, like we said you know say that you don't have, you don't have to be the voice 
of of all of of all of your of your race and your culture because you're probably find yourself more but you know in a classroom you know i know that this colleges have, have you know students may have experienced that you know they they represent um the, their ethnicity um you know it, it doesn't you don't, you don't have to feel that way um you know i want to make sure that that you you are you feel that you are comfortable and then there are definitely folks who are really support you um as you transition to college i know that first for myself um you know, be, being of Latino background, you know, I think that was an opportunity for me to learn more about, you know, my, my heritage, my background, and, and really engage with other, 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 you know, students of color, but also learn about other cultures. I mean, that's, that's the best way to, to do is, is you learn um, from each other's background. And that's what makes you, you know, someone a well rounded person once you do graduate. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, that's the advantage uh, of you, um, you know, being, being a, a college student. Um, and I know that, you know, you, you're not alone on these campuses. There is definitely support. You just got to be, so, you know, be out there um, and, and seek these opportunities out or these mentors that will help you as you transition to the university. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and, and like the opportunity to learn from other cultures. Um, and then also, Ms. Mindy, can you talk about this with race and like being a uh, Haitian American? Uh, the student mentioned she's a uh, Haitian American in, in a white campus. But then can you also mention the option of HBCUs as well, right? And so, you know, and some of the benefits of that, you because know, I'm just talking because I, I went to an HBCU. So I, you know, just uh, if you can mention a little bit about that as well, but, but you know, minority on a majority campus and then HBCUs and the difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, you know, let's be real about um, our campuses that are predominantly white institutions. Um, uh, as uh, a Haitian-born uh, immigrant myself, um, I went to Boston College, which is a predominantly white institution. Um, and what I will the the what I will offer to our scholars here on this call tonight is, you have to be deeply rooted in who you are as a person, and in what is important in terms of your cultural or ethnic background. That is very important, is to really know yourself because what happens when you get on that campus is you get all the messages that you don't belong because you don't see you represented in the faculty. You don't see you represented in your classroom spaces, in the labs, um, in the um, uh, dining halls, in your dorm rooms. So you're being hit with all of these sort of invisible wounds throughout the day, throughout your experience at those PWIs. And it's really important to seek out the resources that are on campus. Um, for me, it was looking specifically at um, the student of color uh, programming. So we had something at Boston College called the Ahana Students uh, Programs. Um, so that was my safe haven. That is where I felt at home. I found my um, ability to thrive in being able to connect in that very safe space, right? Um, so knowing whether or not there are spaces like that on a PWI's campus is going to be an indicator of, of whether or not you'll feel comfortable in attending. The other thing that has been popping up in different higher education institutions is something called the Office for uh, First Generation uh, College Students. Uh, and so this, these sorts of offices are directly linked to services um, that are um, services and support that are there to support our first gen college uh, students. Um, and so that's the feeling of being sort of an imposter on campus. That's a feeling of, you know, loneliness and not seeing other people like you. So having our PWIs have these um, solutions to these um, problems is really important while you're doing your research, right? In terms of the um, historical Black uh, colleges or universities, that is also an amazing option that we just haven't, um, I feel that hasn't been pushed uh, for our scholars, because mostly if you're in New England, you stay in New England, you don't go too far outside of that. Um, and there are many different reasons for that, right? And so I think um, when, we, when we think about um, what colleges are gonna be the best fit and match for us, we have to think about what is it that we can withstand? What is it that we want to 
um, experience. And if that experience is deeply rooted in seeing the um, African diaspora flourish around you, then perhaps a predominantly white institution isn't the best choice for you. If maybe, it, I'm not saying don't apply, I'm saying make sure you have other options within the mix. Thank you, thank you so much. This is really great and important topic. Um, we, there were some questions about, um, uh, you know, uh, how to become a doctor. We have this student mentioned, this is for Mr. Abbott. So he says, uh, if you wanted to become a doctor when you're older, do you think community college is a good uh, place to start learning more about pre-med or is it a big college? What's the best option? And what are the benefits of starting at a community college? Um, and then just along with that, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm asking a lot from you, Mr. Abbott, but we also have from Omar, he says, what helps him get into college and like, you know, he wants to go to Harvard and attend medical school and become a heart surgeon. You, you continue that dream, Omar, but, and, and Mr. Abbott, what could you do to help Omar as well after you talk about the community college? If you could mention that too, please. Thank you. Yeah, I can, uh, I can do my best. Thanks. That's a great question and, and great series of questions. Um, so first of all, I think, you know, uh, the one thing I would, I would emphasize that we've been saying really since the beginning is that there's no one way to do things and there's no right way and no wrong way uh, to do this. It's really about your journey and what's going to help you do what you want to do best. Um, so, you know, I think it's great if you've identified a goal and you want to get there. Just remember that there's many paths uh, to get there. And I think, uh, number one, that helps to alleviate some of the pressure and thinking that there's only one way I'm going to get, um, you know, get to this, uh, get to this goal. So um, addressing the community college piece first, I think community college can be a great way to start off for a lot of students. Um, it really depends a lot on, you know, remember that community colleges, just like all other colleges and universities are all very different from one another. So I think you want to do the same kinds of investigation in terms of what kind of support is there, what kind of track record do they have for placement into other schools? Um, is this really going to help prepare me in the way that I want to, you know, those kinds of things, because like every other college and university out there, they run the full spectrum. You know, there's community colleges that are fantastic places to get your start. There's other places where particularly if the advising or or uh, the resources and things like that are not as strong. Um, you know, I know some, some folks who've gone the community college route and really gotten kind of stuck because they're not getting that advising into the next, uh, the next level. So you remember there's a huge diversity among community colleges and what they do and what they do well and all that kind of stuff. Um, I would also say, you know, uh, too, to remember that sometimes the, the, Four-year schools, again, are also very different. And, you know, one of the most important questions, rather than thinking, should I go community college and then four-year, is also looking at the different types of schools. Because some four-year schools, in fact, I would say a lot of four-year schools, particularly in this day and age, um, are really set up to provide a, a comprehensive four-year experience. And they do a really, really great job at providing resources and advising and all that kind of stuff to get you through. So sometimes I think one of the reasons that people are intimidated by four-year schools is, wow, I'm just going to get thrown into the, into the mix and I'm not going to know what's going on and I'm not going to know where to start and I'm not going to be able to um, you know, bridge, you know, into the programs that I want. And so again, that really comes down to knowing the individual schools and what are they offering? What's the, what's the track record? What's the student graduation rate like? Um, you know, if you're looking towards med school, what's their placement into medical schools looking like? So, um, so again, there's not a right answer. There's not a wrong answer. It's not do community college, then do Harvard. It's not community college, then do a four-year public institution. Um, it's, whatever you think is going to is going to get you where you need to where you need to be. Um, I also really encourage people to be flexible, particularly with those big dreams. Um, I'll share a story with one of the students that I work with really closely ever since she was a junior in high school. Amazing young woman. She was set on being a doctor from I think the time that she was conceived. Um, she was just that was her lifelong dream. And she came here to Dartmouth. Native American student and she got here and she started exploring the curriculum and she you know was basically assuming she was going to go pre med the moment that she got here. And she actually discovered that there were so many other things she wanted to do um, opportunities to study abroad opportunities to really pursue a passion she had for languages. She ended up creating a double major between romance languages and Native American studies. And then she took a fifth year at Mills College to do what we call post back um, in order to get her pre med requirements ready for moving on to medical school. Now she's at UC San, Fr um, San Francisco, 
uh, in her third year and she's number one in her class. Um, and she said it was the best decision I ever made was to focus my undergrad years on something else that I wanted to do, take a full year to concentrate on my pre-med requirements and then go on to med school and hit the ground running. So there's lots and lots of different ways to get where you wanna go. Um, and I think sometimes people put so much pressure on themselves that they gotta hit that treadmill. And the moment I get their freshman year, I gotta start with a pre-health curriculum. And then maybe they find it's harder than they thought it was gonna be. Maybe they find there's other things they wanna do. Um, so keep that, keep that flexibility in mind and, and take advantage of those doors when they open for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That was really, really helpful. So uh, the next question uh, is for Mr. Donis. Um, we have the COVID question today. Um, how does the application process differ this year because of COVID-19? And so, um, and, and what should they be aware of? And that's for the 12th graders? What it should be, what about the 11th graders? Cause this may or may not go away depending on what's going on in our country. So can you kind of touch on that, Mr. Donis? So yeah, definitely. Um, so with COVID-19, um, it's, it's all a learning curve even for the mission, you know, folks. So we, I would say we're all in this together. I mean, never before, before we got on the, on the panel, we were conversing that I, we, I typically travel, I visit high schools, I, I want to be in person and have that 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 one on one, you know, that in person touch. But as far as the application process, I think one big thing that that Stephen mentioned, you know, all of our schools are test optional. So then more than ever before, we, we're flexible with, with testing, and that shouldn't be a, a factor. So I want to say that this shouldn't be a challenge or a burden when you're applying for, for, for schools. So as far as a applying in the process. Um, what I've shared with my other colleagues, you know, in the field that it's not looking different as far as applying, you know, deadlines have not been adjusted. Um, what, what I've seen out there. So you should do your part and apply and, and, and get your information and material uh, in, and on time. And, and, and this is your, if this is your first time going through the process, you may not know different, but you just want to make sure that you abide by the, by, by the guidelines and the deadlines. I feel with the application process, you are you should usually have the opportunity to come visit schools. So every school is a little bit different. You want to do research. Some schools are not able, you're not able to get on campus because they're doing full remote. Um, some institutions can do a drive-through tour. You want to kind of get a feel of the location. You also have schools that, that do a, a campus tour. So, so you might want to view that a little bit differently about, you know, having access to these institutions with the process. We have a lot of juniors and seniors. Um, everything's virtual. So we have a virtual open houses. I would encourage you to attend these virtual open houses because that will be the, the one on one opportunity for you to speak with admission professionals like myself, even professors. So more than ever, um, you know, I know that a lot of students may not have the full access to visit campus, but you should be more in tune than ever before with, with individuals giving you the information. So sometimes it's actually been beneficial for me to connect with students who weren't able to come to my campus, but I'm giving them, you know, that that one on one attention that I can do virtually through a zoom call. Um, so that's something that that has evolved and, and we're doing differently. But as far as, you know, anything else for, for COVID, I, I feel that we're all, all admission officers or, or offices have had to make adjustments and, and to let you know we, we are being flexible. The other piece too is that um, on the Common App, I believe there's a sexual supplemental question that if someone wants to talk more about how the pandemic might affect them, you can put that in, in, in writing. Um, but I want to make sure that you articulate with with what you put in, put in and present um, you know at, you know you know present well um, in your writing skills when you when you're discussing it. In addition to the regular essay, so. So I just want to let you know that we have the, you know, we're on this together. And, and as far as the mission process, um, it's not looking so different, but you want to kind of look at the different layers that you may have to do differently to really get involved or, or more, learn more about the institution. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for summarizing so accurately that COVID. That's, that was a big question. So thank you for handling that with such a plume. That was great. Now, uh, ten, uh, Ms. Uh, Manita, we just have a couple questions. You mentioned the, 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 the four chair, the four legs of the chair. Just love that metaphor and the personal uh, passion. This, these questions are based about leadership and how to, you know, how to manage all this and, you know, how to describe it. And so the questions are, you know, what are some ways to show leadership other than being in a leadership position for clubs? And then also, uh, how do you balance extracurriculars and schoolwork? Uh, what, what if I don't have enough time for extracurriculars due to an overwhelming amount of schoolwork and all those classes you're trying to get in? Um, and then how do you write about that in your essay? You're struggling with it and how do you write about it? And could you even mention about like, is it okay to even speak about mental health, you know, and how much should you share? So. 
Great, all great questions. Um, in terms of leadership, I will always say this. Um, a title is not indicating of your leadership abilities. What you need to do in terms of thinking about what you, how you spend your time. Are you a leader for your family? Are you taking care of your siblings at home? Are you taking care of um, older relatives at home? You're a leader, right? Are you, you know, you know, you might not be the captain of the sports team that you're a part of, but everybody comes to you for advice. You're the one who, you know, says the motivational speech or when the team is getting down, you're, you're the one who gives the pep talk. Um, you're a leader without that title of co-captain or captain. Um, so when you think about leadership, think about the qualities of a leader. Someone who is very generous of their time. Someone who is able to listen. Um, someone who is able to impart wisdom without judgment. These are all things that we do each and every day, and we don't give ourselves props for it. For me, being a good leader is essentially being a good ancestor. And so whatever that means for you and yours is how you would describe that within your um, application. Um, in terms of balancing the many different um, aspects that you have to balance as um, a member of the Gen Z uh, <laughs> uh, population, one of the things that I will say about that is you have to carve out time for you. There can't be you with all of the different responsibilities that you have without making intentional space and time for you to do something that you really love to do, whether it's sit and read, whether it's, um, you know, turning on the TV and just like not thinking about the world for a second. All of those things you need to take time and practice them intentionally. Some might say, you know, meditate. It's hard for a high school student to meditate unless you've been a part of those intentional practices, right? So think about what makes you um, happy, what, what helps you decompress and intentionally schedule it. Just like you schedule when you're gonna be in class, when are you gonna um, you know, be on another Zoom meeting for a club? When are you gonna go outside? You have to schedule in that time and be intentional about um, that time. In terms of mentioning it in your um, college application essay, um, uh, you know, mental health matters, and that's huge. One of the ways that I help students speak on it is being able to touch upon the negatives of their life, but quickly turn it into how did they push through. So that grit and that resiliency that you can exhibit through telling your story without leaning so heavily into the trauma part of it, but saying, this is how I got out of the trauma. This is how I circumvented the trauma. This is how I pushed through the trauma. Whatever your story is, it is important because it's your story. And that's the beauty of it. No one else can tell it better than you. And so being able to own how you went through a process, however hard it, it must have been, being able to show that there was a rainbow at the other end and that you're still looking for that end goal of positivity and light. And that's what I would say is how you can speak on it in the college admissions essay without um, feeling that you are putting yourself at a disadvantage. Thank you so very much. That's a fantastic, fantastic question. And so um, our, our, next, our next question is gonna be again, uh, you know, we're, we're getting closer to the end of time. So, but we still want the panelists is so, so wonderful. I'm just learning so much. And thank you all the students that are just sending these great questions. Like, um, this is really, really great. And please continue as best as you can. But this one is for all the panelists. And we're gonna start with Mr. Abbott on this one. Uh, what do you, what do you wish that students knew going into the application process? What do, you know, if it's one or two things, what is it they, what is that they need to know? Yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great question. I think um, 
one of the first things I would always share, and hopefully it's come across from all of us at this point, is that um, there's really no such thing as the right school or the best school. There's only the right school or the best school for you. Um, and so really taking the time to kind of look through all the different options that are out there and uh, finding the schools that are really going to help you do what you want to do and be your best self. And the other thing is that this really is about you. And again, it's not so much uh, worrying about what anything in particular that we're looking for or one right way of doing things, but it really is that reflection of your own story and your own journey um, and sharing that as best as possible. You know, I think back a hundred years ago when I applied to colleges, um, I had no idea who was, I didn't even give any thought to who was on the other end. This was actually back when you had to put stuff in the mail too. So, you know, you just dropped it in that mailbox and, you know, somewhere somebody made decisions, you know, affecting the, the lives of America's teenagers. And, um, you know, you are actually talking to people on the other end. You're sharing your story with real live people um, like Kirsch, like Tammy Fee, like myself. Um, and we want to get to know you. We want to know your story. And that's what this process is really all about. So. I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. And Mr. Donis, what is it that you wish the students know and that you always kind of get the same questions like, oh, I wish they knew this and how wonderful they are? I would say that, you know, do not be afraid to talk to us. Um, we're our friendly people. I know we are decision makers. And I think uh, Tammy Fee said it best, you know, you know, we're not, we don't cancel anybody. It's, it's you're a candidate, we evaluate you and we coach you and we advise you. I mean, the ultimate goal is, to, to admit you to our institutions, um, but I wanna make, let you know that you can build a relationship. The tip that I can also give is that the person that, the college that, or university that you apply to, the person you build a relationship will be the person reading your application. Um, so that's the person that you wanna build a relationship. And many many of us are probably have a background of, of increasing diversity. We wanna definitely advocate for you. So if it's a committee, I can say, you know, for this individual, I, I see on their paper, I can further explain what where their background, their school, and I can convince the committee to give you the opportunity. So the, the advice I mean, I'm, I'm letting you know is that you, you should be building your, your relationship with a counselor that, that falls in your territory. Um, it's just not, you know, you can do your clicks, but you can do research and, and put the names to the faces. Like I said, you can have the opportunity to set up one-on-one um, -on -one, um, Zoom meetings um, with, with, with admission offices or even, even connect with current students. I think that's another piece that I want to add that many of our, our program and advice, you know, I'm going to tell you, and like Stephen said, I, I played college for many years ago too, but you really want to hear about the current student. A lot of times they have programs, students of color, and they're going to give you the real deal. They're going to let you know what, 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 how the, the campus is um, in, in how to best, you know, maybe uh, increase your chances of applying or how the atmosphere is. Because um, many of them may have potentially done some kind of alternative program to get into a, um, um, you know, institution. So you start becoming aware of, of, of these access programs um, if that fits, you know, your, your background. So it's really connecting with the admissions officers a little more. We are definitely, want, we are people uh, persons. That's why we're in the field and we definitely want to, to work with you and also connecting with current students. And that will be my other uh, tip. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, make sure you're reaching out and connecting with other students. Uh, Ms. Manid, can you also mention, what, what do you wish that students knew? Um, that there are many different pathways to get to the end goal. And just because your heart is set on one pathway, um, that either or thinking uh, is problematic. Uh, and to I wish, I wish everybody knew that they can get to the end result many different ways. And if we look at some of the folks that we admire nowadays and we looked at the age that they made it, we're talking about early 40s, y'all. So we got some time. There's no reason to rush. You got some time. And I know it feels like you don't. And yes, you know, tomorrow is not promised to any one of us. But there are many different ways of getting to your end goal. And um, you just have to choose one. Choose the one that fits for you. Thank you so much, Ms. Manit. And that's just wonderful advice. And now we'll go to like our, our closing thoughts from our panelists. Um, and this is going to be another question uh, for the presenters. Um, what advice do the presenters have for ensuring a student's success through the application process and in college? So not just to 
to get into college, but to be successful there too. Um, and Mr. Abbott, can you touch a bit on this? Um, and then we'll go to, uh, to Mr. Donis and then Ms. Maneev. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I definitely would always encourage everyone to, to remember uh, those motivations. You know, I think uh, so many people come to higher education for amazing reasons. You know, people want to make an impact um, in the world. They want to make an impact on their community. Um, they want to help their family, you know, those kinds of things. So remember those, you know, remember those motivators, um, staying true to who you are. Uh, I think a lot of times people think that they have to shed some aspect of their identity when they get to college and check that at the door and and become something else. And you absolutely don't don't have to do that. Um, you know, you're you're admitted for a reason. You got there for um, all the things that you've done. Like Kirsch said earlier, you don't get there by accident. You don't get there because you didn't work hard. Um, and don't let anyone tell you differently than that. You've earned your spot um, and make the most of it and um, do the best you can with the opportunities that you have. I think it's really, really important to, um, sometimes these places, you know, the challenges that are present, presented, whether it's those struggles of, you know, being in a predominantly white institution or just the day-to-day -day grind of work to do and everything else can wear people down. Um, and it's really important to remember to take advantage of all those opportunities that these places provide for you while you have that chance, um, because they're all going to uh, create some really, really amazing uh, paths forward for you. So, Thank you so much. And, and, and that's really helpful. Mr. Donis, um, could you mention as well, like, you know, how to ensure student success through this application process, but to get there, but also be successful while you're in there when you get to that promised land? Of college. Yeah, I know. Short on, short on time. How, you know, I would say, you know, you, you really want to stay organized with the process. You want to make sure you know the deadlines. And when I say that human nature, you hit click or hit submit your application at 1159 and the deadlines the next day, please do not do that. You want to give yourself a, two, a couple of days before that. This way you can pr produce the, the, the best application put forward. We, we, we pay attention to these details. So I really will want you to take your time um, and, and know exactly which school that you want to apply. Once you're, in, once you're at the, the university, you, you want to build your network, you know, connect with students. You want to see and do research and see how, how you can be more active in, in that community. Um, you know, the other piece I would say, you know, keep looking for information. When we talked about uh, campus tours, there's a lot of interactive information. There's virtual tours that you can do. Um, so I would recommend that you continue, you know, connecting with students. And, you know, once you're there, you know, I would say you, you did earn that spot. And, and you know, be professional or, or coaching. You know, if you're a first generation of college students, these are things that, that I wasn't aware, you know, since I'm a first gen student, you know, you know, you can say thank you to the mission counselors you know, that, that they have took the time to talk to you, uh, even saying a thank you email. So more than ever that you can do that. And it really does uh, make a difference in, in that you are very serious about your candidacy and that you want to be at the institution that you applied for. Thank you so much. And Ms. Mani, we're short on time, but we would love to hear from you. What could they do to ensure success? Yeah, so um, I echo everything that my colleagues have already said. Um, the one thing I will just double down on is making sure that you look at what is the end goal and map out the many different ways of getting to that end goal. And once you do that, it will become crystallized exactly what you need to do at every juncture along your pathway. Okay, great. And thank you so much. We're about at that time. I want to thank the, uh, the speakers, the panelists, um, uh, Mr. Stephen Abbott, Mr. Kirsch uh, Adonis, Adonis and uh, Ms. Uh, Tammy Faye uh, Manid, you were absolutely wonderful. You dropped some knowledge, thank you. Thank you for all the participants for joining us and the Q&A and all the BSC, BSCP staff that brought us together. And uh, thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you back next week for the second session of this series, Getting Into College Part Two, focusing on the essay and personal statement. You can register for that webinar and all the webinars in the series now on the BSCP website, www.bscp.org. And have a good night. And uh, I'll just turn this over to Ms. Uh, Holly Boric uh, De Silva. And thank you very much. Oh, and please uh, look at this poll. And before you log out, if you can just um, answer the questions in the poll. Before you leave, uh, thank you so much. It was so much fun. I learned so much. Yes, please answer the questions in the poll. Oh, 
And yep, and once you enter the poll, then it's uh it's a wrap. And we look forward to seeing you next week. So please register and learn all you need to learn from these. We'll have another round of expert panelists again for you next next week. And thank you so much. And good night.